in the class. Okay, so when we left off, we were talking about the synapse. So we had talked about how we have a, an action potential come down our axon. We know that that's a wave of depolarization. A sodium comes into the cell. We hit threshold of negative 55 and depolarize. Sodium stops coming in and calcium, sorry, potassium starts leaving. So we repolarize. And as potassium continues to leave, we dip a little below. So we have that after hyperpolarization. And that's happening at every little section of the membrane down our axon until we reach the axon terminal. So our first step of synaptic communication is when the action potential actually reaches our axon terminal. And we have our final type of voltage gated channel we care about, which are our calcium channels. So calcium wants to go into cells. We're just going to remember that that's what calcium likes to do. Its uh, equilibrium potential is way high up. Um, I didn't have it memorized, but in office hours, someone asked. So I can now tell you it's about 137 millivolts. So super high, thank you. <laughs> um, this triggers the release of neurotransmitters. So neurotransmitters have been made in our neuron. They're packaged into vesicles. The vesicles then fuse to the membrane and leave the cell via exocytosis. And calcium was our signal to tell them to do that. It's actually the case if we end up with more calcium in the axon terminal, we release more neurotransmitter and end up with more neurotransmitter in the synapse. So that's a little different than when we talked about our action potential, which is all or nothing, just one or the other. So we can have variable amounts of neurotransmitter. That's just kind of a fun fact for you here. Okay. So then we have the neurotransmitter diffusing and binding to a receptor on our post synaptic neuron, the postsynaptic neuron being the second one in the chain, which triggers a response in the cell. And spoiler alert for the rest of the, today, the response of that cell is either going to be to start depolarizing. So we'll have an excitatory response. Excuse me? Oh, yep. What's that? Um, I can't see the slides. Okay. Thank you for letting me know. Can you see yeah, them now? Of course. Yeah, I can. Thank you. Okay, great. Okay, where was I? Um, this is the right. So the response in the cell, as we'll see today, is either going to be excitatory, so getting closer to the threshold for that cell, or it'll be inhibitory, getting farther away from the threshold for that cell. So basically hyperpolarization. Then we gotta get rid of the neurotransmitter. So our receptor is gonna let go of it. So the neurotransmitter itself doesn't actually usually go into that postsynaptic cell. It gets re-released into the synaptic cleft. And then it's either going to be broken down by an enzyme, which would be embedded on a membrane somewhere in this picture on the postsynaptic cell, could be on some accessory cells around called glial cells, which you should know from your mastering A and P. Um, or it can get taken back up into the original cell. So this is a reuptake molecule. So we pull neurotransmitter back into the axon terminal. And so uh, we can then reuse it basically. So some medications target like reuptake molecules so that we have neurotransmitter in the synaptic cleft a little longer and can create therefore more of a response in our next cell. <clears throat> This process takes a little while. So on the order of 0.5 to 5 milliseconds uh, is how long it takes between the time we get an action potential coming down our axon, getting to the axon terminal, and an actual effect on these, this postsynaptic cell. So this postsynaptic VM, the membrane potential in our postsynaptic cell, so like number five. This time, Sometimes people think it's due to the amount of time it physically takes to cross the synapse, but that's not true. It's actually that this whole calcium process that we've just looked at, right? We have one, two, three, four steps, right? Before we get to actually having neurotransmitter in the cleft, that's what takes all the time. 
some synapses have fast reactions in the postsynaptic cell, and some synapses have slower reactions in the postsynaptic cell. So what we're about to go through, both of these are still chemical synapses. So we're still thinking neurotransmitter crossing a synaptic cleft. Our electrical synapses were the gap junctions and, and they're separate from all of this. So these are two types of chemical synapse we're thinking about now. So the first is something called a channel link receptor or an ionotropic receptor. We're gonna see that word ionotropic again in one of our future units. So I'm just gonna circle that for us. Okay. So when we say it's a receptor, We've seen in that previous image where the receptors are, but someone want to remind me which cell this is on? Yeah, the postsynaptic cell. So we're thinking about the type of receptor we have on the postsynaptic cell that's interacting with that neurotransmitter in the synaptic cleft. So an ionotropic receptor or channel linked receptor is like channels we've seen before, right? So we know that a channel protein forms a tube across the membrane, allowing ions to go through. We saw that some of them were open, right? We had our leak channels, we've had our voltage gated channels. These ionotropic receptors, they're responding to neurotransmitters. Um, so if you've seen them in past classes, you might also have called them uh, ligand gated ion channels. Um, the neurotransmitter in this case would be that ligand. Okay. So all that happens in an ionotropic receptor is our neurotransmitter has a spot to bind onto the channel. And that's like the key to the channel. So when it binds in, the channel opens up and we can have ions flow through. This creates a relatively fast change in the membrane potential because just like we saw in our action potential, right? As soon as you open those voltage-gated sodium channels, sodium starts rushing in. Same thing could happen here with our ionotropic receptors. If this happens to be a type of excitatory neurotransmitter and an excitatory receptor, right? We could open up and allow sodium to come rushing in here, creating a depolarization in our postsynaptic cell. The thing about channels, right? As soon as this neurotransmitter leaves, this channel closes up again. So it's a fast response, but it's also not a very long lasting response because the neurotransmitter has to be bound in there for that channel to be open. So our other type of chemical synapse receptor we're gonna think about our G protein coupled receptors or our metabotropic receptors. And we'll see that word again as well. So I'm making sure you remember both terms. Okay. And who has talked about G protein coupled receptors before in their prereqs? And like two ish hands. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> fundamentals of a G protein coupled receptor. We still have a protein here, uh, pick a brighter color. Okay, so we still have a membrane protein. We're still on our postsynaptic cell and we still have a neurotransmitter binding in. The difference between a G protein coupled receptor and the channel linked receptor, so this protein isn't a channel, right? That's why it's not in the name. What it is, is a protein that's attached to another protein this blue one is our G protein. And then that G protein is the one that does stuff in the cell. Um, so actually this image on the right is a, a little simpler and easier to understand. So here we have our neurotransmitter, so this orange rectangle, binding into the receptor, which is this orange like, I don't know, eggplant shaped, butternut squash thing going on here. And that activates our G protein. Once the G protein is activated, what actually happens is it breaks apart. And so part of it squiggles down the membrane. So this is like part of that G protein that broke off. And that piece of the G protein can then bind to an ion channel. So eventually a channel still opens, 
But you can see that this takes more steps than right neurotransmitter binds to channel channel over. So this is why metabotropic receptors are slower action. They don't directly open an ion channel immediately. We have to go through this intermediary, the G protein. We also do have two types of metabotropic receptors. So this was our direct coupling. So the simpler one is just where we have neurotransmitter and receptor, G protein breaks apart, we open a channel. So that's direct coupling. As you can see, this image on the left is a little busier. It's the same basic idea, right? So we still have our receptor with the neurotransmitter. We still have the G protein. So the G protein is still breaking apart. But as you can see here, it didn't go over and open an ion channel. What it did was it hit an enzyme, which makes a second messenger. And usually this is cyclic AMP, something like that. Um, but we'll talk about that in the future. You don't have to worry about that for now. But then that second messenger is the one that opens the ion channel. So, so this is even longer, as you can see. So when the G protein ion channel that's in it closes, or is it two different bits of we yeah, we would have to remove it from the ion channel to have it okay. yeah. Would it go back to its uh, it's complex? It? Probably, yeah, usually. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, sometimes it requires like another molecule to come remove it and it has to like get phosphorylated. Uh, so it's even slower. And this is a, a longer lasting process basically, especially if we have the second messenger system because then we have our messenger floating around in the cytoplasm of the cell. And we have to actually remove that messenger from the cytoplasm before we stop opening channels. What's in the neurotransmitter that makes the receptor? Yeah, so that has to do with proteins and the shape. So remember when we talked about enzymes, how you have like this specific shaped molecule come into the enzyme, they fit together, and then there's actually a change in the shape of the enzyme. That's the same thing that happens in receptors. So they fit together in a specific way. That's why they're attracted to each other. And then once they're bound in, it's all those R groups on the different amino acids and all the complex weird fully part of the protein. Suddenly, we have slightly different chemical reactions going on between parts of the protein, and it kind of distorts it, basically. What is the, um, the purpose of all of the different groups? So, the proposed second, basically, the third one. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so, like the ionotropic versus the two metabotropic ones? Yeah. What is the difference? Like, why, what is the purpose of how many? It's basically how fast we want something to happen and how long lasting we want it to happen. You know what I mean? So yeah. sometimes you're going to want to trigger a neuron real quick, but then cut it off. But sometimes you want to have like an ongoing process of where a neuron like maybe keeps firing action potentials for a couple seconds or um, a while until you turn it off, right? Like sometimes you want to like actually flip the switch and keep it on. So that you might use like um, a metabotropic receptor with a second messenger system, for example. So it's, a, it's about what kind of process you want to have going on in the body afterwards. So, like, if you wanted, to, if your body wanted to release adrenaline for a long time, that would be kind of like probably that would involve at least a similar system to these metabotropic receptors. Gotta, gotta brush up on what receptor is involved there, which we will get to eventually. I think it's not so in detail. But yeah, something like that. Yeah. Whereas like, if you think about like a reflex, for example, right? Like say you just have that thing where the doctor like kicks your, uh, sorry, you, the doctor <laughs> puts a hammer to your knee and you kick out, right? Like you don't wanna keep doing that over and over again, right? Like you want that to end. Um, so it would be something analogous to that for, for neurons, basically. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this slide is just emphasizing that technically what we're doing to the postsynaptic cell is we're causing a graded potential to happen. So when we talked about graded potentials at the beginning, we talked about a stimulus coming in and having an effect. 
So for these postsynaptic cells, the stimulus all is this neurotransmitter that's binding onto their receptor. So this means that we're going to see these words that we looked at a while ago with our graded potentials, right? So if we make our cell depolarize, we make that membrane potential more positive, it's excitatory. So this stands for excitatory postsynaptic. So we're listing first the effect, then we're listing where the effect is, and then the other key is potential. So it's just telling us that this is talking about the membrane potential. Yeah. So the stimulus here is the neurotransmitter. Yeah. The neurotransmitter binding and the receptor. So here's where we can do a, a little memorization to make our lives easier instead of memorizing equilibrium potentials all the time. Basically, if you open a sodium channel or a calcium channel, we've seen throughout our previous lectures, both sodium and calcium are positive ions that want to enter cells. So anytime we open a sodium channel or a calcium channel, this is going to cause excitation of the postsynaptic cell. So it's going to depolarize, it's going to get closer to threshold. So both sodium and calcium channels result in EPSPs. By contrast, we could also open a channel that causes potassium to leave a cell. Right? And we know that potassium for our action potential, right, it's always dropping down the membrane, right? So we had it repolarized, but then we had it also cause that after hyperpolarization. So that should help you remember that potassium is inhibitory. So when we say it's inhibitory, making us move farther away from that resting membrane potential and therefore farther away from the threshold. So this makes it less likely that our postsynaptic cell is going to fire off its own action. We haven't talked about chloride ions before, but for now, just remember that chloride ions actually also want to enter the cell, but they're negative, they're an anion. So if we let chloride ions into the cell, the cell becomes more negative, just like if we let potassium ions leave the cell. So that would also be inhibitory and make the cell less likely to fire. Questions about this before we run through some some examples and tack on a couple more ideas. This is what you should should just come back to is like the basics for for all these flow charts that we're going to see in a second. So postsynaptic potential is just the change in the membrane potential of that second cell of that postsynaptic cell, so the one that's receiving the neurotransmitter. So it's responding to the receptor, grabbing onto the neurotransmitter, then binding together, and having some type of response, whether it's immediately opening an ion channel because we're an ionotropic receptor, or whether we're having a slower response mediated by a G protein, maybe a second messenger involved, um, which would be our metabotropic receptor. Um, ways that I remember those two words, just throwing it out there. The ionotropic receptors, I remember them because they start with ions, so we're just immediately letting ions in. And the metabotropic receptors, because we have so many steps, I think about it like metabolism, right? We remember metabolism was complicated and potentially slow. So that's how I remember that the metabotropic receptors are the ones that are harder, <laughs> basically. Okay. So for our excitatory postsynaptic potential, the most common neurotransmitter we have is glutamate. So when I say that we have a neurotransmitter that causes an excitatory postsynaptic potential, I'm not saying that like glutamate gets into cells and is excitatory itself. I'm saying that when glutamate binds to a receptor, that like lets sodium ions in, right? That that's often an action of glutamate. Our most common inhibitory 
postsynaptic potential neurotransmitter is something called GABA. So that's just an example of something that might, for example, open a potassium channel or open, open a chloride channel. More ways of saying what excitatory versus inhibitory means are excitatory um, postsynaptic potential are depolarization. So they're getting us closer to threshold. So we're more likely to produce an action potential. And that's why we call them excitatory, right? We think of an excited cell as being like boop, 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 firing action potential. Inhibitory. Kind of slower, we're less likely to produce an action potential, we're stuck on the couch, we don't want to move. This is because we are either hyperpolarized or we're not going to talk about membrane stabilization much because it's kind of complicated and really for our purposes it's enough for me that you just know it exists. But a form of inhibitory postsynaptic potentials basically has to do with this idea that we can do certain things to cells that even if we let a sodium ion in, the cell is gonna kind of even that out and stop us from depolarizing too much. So here we have some examples of EPSPs. So ways we could have excitation in our postsynaptic cell. So the first one here, we see a neurotransmitter binding into what type of receptor? Oh, it's Listen, so just say it out loud. <laughs> say it out loud for me, read this word. Ionotropic. Yeah, we're binding to an ionotropic receptor. Uh, and so letting sodium in. We also see there's some potassium coming out, but can focus here on that sodium part. We know sodium has a really strong motivation to get into cells. So this is causing depolarization, which is the same thing as excitation for our purposes. Here we see a metabotropic receptor doing the same thing. So we got our neurotransmitter. We know the G protein does stuff. So specifically it gets activated and then activates an enzyme. So that's this part here. And then we can see that that enzyme made this molecule cyclic AMP which made this molecule protein kinase A, which opened a potassium channel. I'm sorry, which closed a potassium channel. So because potassium can't leave anymore, that also has the effect of bringing us a little closer to threshold because potassium leaving was part of what's dragging us down. Because potassium leaving drags us down towards negative 90 or so when we close a potassium channel, that would also cause excitation. So on the previous slide, we, we were thinking about like, we open a channel, which causes excitation and which causes um, inhibitions, but it's also important to think about, so if our reaction is to close a channel, would that make us more positive or negative? So make sure you think about it that way as well. So are we not likely to see like, the channel when we're talking about physiological processes, we do talk about these a lot. Because um, we, we talk about second messengers a lot. Um, but for my purposes, um, I'll remember that I said this. For my purposes, what I, what I want you to just kind of get down for now is just that difference between ionotropic and metabotropic. So either way. Um, and I'll, I'll make sure. But I don't know to myself right now not to quiz you too much on the difference between a direct coupling versus the indirect. I think this is maybe plenty for us. We'll talk a lot about even more details on different types of receptors in the future, which is why I'm saying we want to get the basics down to now. So here we see some examples of inhibitory synapses. So here we see a neurotransmitter bonding to an ionotropic receptor. You see that lets potassium leave the cell. Potassium leaving the cell makes us more negative. So we could draw that more negative, which makes it harder to fire off an action. Potential. 
So like this is analogous to what's happening during our relative refractory period, right? So this was part of what made it harder to fire off an action potential in our presynaptic cells as well. Um, so when, sorry, when potassium bleeds, sometimes I get tripped up that K makes it cut down. Sorry, guys. <laughs> uh, so when potassium bleeds, that makes it harder to become more positive. So if potassium is out, that's an IPSP and inhibitory postsynaptic potential. If chloride channels open, chloride just wants to move in. So chloride ions want to move in. They're negative, so that's also inhibitory. And chloride ions are also the ones that are responsible for this complex process of stabilizing a membrane. So that's kind of what we see happening over here. Uh, and basically chloride moves in ways that respond to like sodium levels and uh, changes to the membrane potential. So that kind of acts like a buffer. We talked about buffers at some point in chemistry before. We can think about membrane stabilization as kind of like a buffer. It's not exactly the same, but, but conceptually it's kind of like that. So we could think about this in a different flow chart form. So postsynaptic potentials are graded potentials, right? So now we're just using another term, a more specific term because graded potentials are kind of general. You can have a graded potential in a presynaptic cell as well. So postsynaptic potential is specifying that it's a graded potential in our postsynaptic cell, so in that second one in the chain. So for example, if we have a high frequency of action potential, there's gonna be like a lot of stimuli coming in, right? As we talked about graded potentials, that's gonna cause calcium to start to build up kind of in that axon terminal, right? Because we know that's kind of a slow process. So we're going to release more neurotransmitter. More neurotransmitter would then bind to channels or receptors. So a bunch of channels are opening or closing. So we could have more or less increase in ion permeability, which means we could have more or less movement of ion flux. In this case, it's saying greater hyperpolarization. So this is technically an example of an inhibitory um, postsynaptic potential, but the flow would be similar in an excitatory one. And since they didn't specify what ion they're talking about when they said open or close, really, you could just say greater like reaction at the bottom here. Right. So the flow of things would be similar in both of these. Why we have this flow chart um, is to just kind of jog your, your memory of that idea that graded potentials add together. We have that temporal and spatial summation, right? So if we end up with more neurotransmitter, since that neurotransmitter like is our stimulant, right? Causing the uh, postsynaptic potential, causing that graded potential in our second cell. If we have more neurotransmitter, we're likely to have those graded potentials add up together, either temporally. So like if we have one receptor, it binds to our neurotransmitter, opens less sodium, neurotransmitter lets go, but then another neurotransmitter comes in, opens again. Right? So that would be like our temporal summation that we talked about originally with the graded potentials. Or if we have multiple receptors on our postsynaptic cell, Different neurotransmitters come to two receptors. Those are channels open up, ions come into the cell. That would be like our spatial summation we talked about originally. So, the bigger concept that we kind of like step back if we have a bird's eye view here means that if we go all the way to backwards and think backwards from these. Uh, graded potentials adding up at the end. It's basically that the frequency of action potentials in that presynaptic cell has an effect on how strong a response there is in our postsynaptic cell. So we can't make like a really big action potential, right? Remember the all or nothing, that's not a thing. But what we can do is either fire slowly or fire quickly. If we fire quickly, because graded pet pistols add together, we're going to have more of a reaction. 
Does that kind of make sense? So in an excitatory synapse, we'd have a neurotransmitter bind into a receptor. Remember, we emphasize at first that sodium and calcium want to flow into cells. I think that's calcium two plus. Um, so that could be a way we get excitatory reactions, or we could have potassium close. So that requires a little more mental twisting, but potassium wants to leave cells. So if it stays in there, it's essentially making us more positive. Um, so that also reacts in an excitatory way, causes excitation. So here we just have, have some more pictures of neurotransmitters for you to look at. So this is, this is kind of showing us some stabilization stuff with the chloride ions. Um, but for my purposes, I just want you to know membrane stabilization can happen. And if you want to add one more fact to that, no, it involves chloride ions. Beyond that, uh, I will also make a note to myself to not quiz you on the exact details of that. But you can kind of see the general idea that like these chloride ions are balancing out the sodium ion coming in. We got some checkpoint questions for you to study from if you so choose. And here we have a reminder of the types of ion channels. All right, remember that our leak channels were always open, they're everywhere, are responsible for keeping us at the resting membrane potential of negative 70. Now is when we're talking about those ligand dated channels. So our ligand dated channels are either ionotropic, uh, if I type, right, so they're either ionotropic, well, really most of our ligand gated channels are ionotropic, but we also have receptors that create um, channels to open, so metabotropic receptors, it's just the binding side is on the other side, so we want to remember just kind of like versus Metabotropic receptors with the G protein. Okay. And those are places we expect to be receiving signals. So they're in the dendrite. We remember most synapses are those axodendritic synapses, but they might also be on the cell body. Our voltage gated channels responsible for the action potential for thinking sodium and potassium. If we're thinking calcium, we're thinking about the release of neurotransmitter. So now we have finally gotten to everything on this slide that we saw in the beginning. <laughs> so that leads us to neural integration. So when we're talking neural integration, we're talking about how all these neurons work together as a system and basically how the system works. Okay, so we're going to think about these concepts of summation. We've already kind of talked about adding stuff together. We're going to talk about frequency coding. And we saw on that flow chart, right, we have this idea that as we send action potentials at different speeds, that has different effects, either more or less neurotransmitter, and therefore more or less response in the uh, synaptic cell. We'll also see divergence and convergence, so we can have signals that are different or the same. And we know that the axon hillock uh, has to reach threshold. So just, just some reminders of things that are happening here. So action potential gets triggered if the axon hillock reaches our threshold of negative 65. So we would say that the axon hillock depolarized the threshold, triggering an action potential. And we talked about that a fair bit. I hope that you guys remember that <laughs> as far into this unit. If you don't, and know that that exists. So that's kind of like our basic thing, our first kind of idea of how the system works, right? We're depolarizing some neurons to threshold, so they're starting off their action potential. So what we might want to realize now, right, is we've been focusing just on like 
one synapse and one kind of chain of neurons, but one presynaptic neuron can go to multiple postsynaptic neurons. All right, so it can be sending out signals to many different places, right, which is di divergence. So we have these things diverging, different things going on here, different signals. We might even have different receptor types at different neurons that we're connecting to. So like numbers one, two, three, and four, those might not be identical uh, postsynaptic neurons with identical responses. But we can also have convergence, which is where like, so they're showing that there are multiple other neurons signaling to the same one. So it's really like, if we have another neuron here, maybe that's also signaling this. And maybe we have many, many, many neurons coming in and signaling here. And this is why we started kind of with our graded potentials because we have to understand that we're going to have to add together signals and sometimes subtract signals, right? If we're thinking inhibition to figure out whether this postsynaptic neuron is actually going to fire or not. And that's our goal is to figure out whether the postsynaptic neuron fires or not. And that's going to depend on what these different signals are coming in. So like, you can think about that as depending on the receptor, or you could think about it as like this neuron, neuron A is releasing a different neurotransmitter than neuron B over here, something like that. So if we simplify those pictures, we're thinking about summation in our postsynaptic neuron. So all we're thinking about is adding together graded potentials. So our IPSPs and our EPSPs, so excitatory and inhibitory, or I should have said that in the opposite order to match your slide, inhibitory and excitatory postsynaptic potentials are graded potentials, so we can add them together. And just a note about your book, whenever they draw something green, they're thinking excitatory. So green, good, depolarizes, yes, we're going to have an action potential versus our inhibitory ones. They color red for you. So that can speed up your reading if you're staring at figures trying to figure them out. Okay. And just like the graded potentials we talked about at the beginning, we can be adding together our graded potentials one synapse at a time. So, like action potential coming into the synaptic cleft, then our neurotransmitter clears, then it comes back again, or it can be spatial receiving several synapses like we have in this picture. So here we see how we might be adding them together, right? So when they show us these graphs, they also are gonna start specifying which neuron is firing. So here they're telling you neuron A fired four times, right? Went once, twice, kind of slow. So our graded potentials are decremental, so they faded away. But then if it goes boom, boom, twice in a row, they add it together, kicking off an action potential in this postsynaptic cell. Here in the image below, got it complicated. Now we have to think about all of these action potentials, sorry, all of these neurons coming in. So it's saying A fired alone, not enough to get us to the threshold, right? There's A, B firing alone, not a enough to get us to the threshold. C firing alone, this one makes it super hard to get to threshold. But if we have, sorry, erase there, great. If we have A and B go at the same time, the spatial summation, right? You can stack them on top of each other, right? So we had A, this peak, then say we layer B on top, I'm going to make it a little bigger so that it shows, right? Because they're about the same height. That gets us to threshold and fires off. But if we add together A and C, if they fire at the same time, then C is going the opposite direction of A. 
So if they're firing at the same time, we might not end up with any change in the membrane potential at all because they would like cancel each other out. So this is this is the, a thing that can get a little complex if you look at these pictures too quickly. Um, but it's really just adding together these concepts that we've been talking about. You just have to be careful that you're really looking at whether the incoming neurons are excitatory or inhibitory, and then making sure that you're adding them together. So our concept of frequency coding is just that the amount of depolarization that we get in the axon hillock is signaled by the frequency of action potentials in like our presynaptic cell. And that's just because if we had more frequent action potentials, they add together, so they sum, so summation could create depolarization if we have something excitatory, right? So then summation, as we add them together at the axon hillock, right? We're making the axon hillock positive and we're, we keep doing that it's also going to create more action potentials. All right, so if we make the axon hillock really positive, we fire off an action potential, it's really positive, it may still be positive after that action potential has passed. So maybe it's even going to trigger another action potential to you know, go after the refractory period of that. So more action potentials, boom, 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 release more neurotransmitter just because more calcium is, is hanging around. And then that creates a greater inhibitory or excitatory postsynaptic potential in the next one. Real quick, um, we also have these things called modulator neurons. So our original chain that we were looking at, right, was our presynaptic neuron to our postsynaptic neuron. But we can actually have modulator neurons come in and kind of hijack what our presynaptic neuron is doing, right? So we'd have our action potential coming down our presynaptic neuron, but then the modulating neuron is connecting here right at the end. So it can either facilitate what that presynaptic neuron is doing to make it easier basically through binding onto its axon, right? So this is an axonic synapse make it release more neurotransmitter. So that's presynaptic facilitation. And I'm sorry that they picked another word than excitation that you have to remember means the same thing, All right? So facilitation, excitation, depolarization, those are all pretty similar terms. Or even though we have an action potential coming down here, even if this is excitatory, the modulating neuron could block it and turn it off. So since we're at time uh, on our review day, we'll we'll practice with those modulating neurons how to how to read these diagrams and try to figure out what's going on. Um, but we'll leave off there for today. And remember, studying we have our exam coming up on Wednesday. I know my office hours are technically Thursday and Friday, but if you want to talk earlier in the week, um, I'm around. Just let me know. I come in at random times on Tuesday, so I want to be there <laughs> if you're coming to see me, so just let me know that you're coming. Thank you. Uh, was that a while back? Yeah. This one? Yeah, I'm going to stop us here. I'm going to see how much stuff we're missing just for my own clarification. Is this again, does it just focus on what we've learned in this section, or is it like first section and this section combined? 
there won't be any direct questions on those first couple chapters. Um, but, but if you don't know what a chemical gradient is, right. that helps you. Yeah. <laughs>